Come on, I give it up for the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen. Stay standing, if you will. Hey, last Sunday night, we had our worship night. I just feel like this morning, worship night's kind of carried over. I feel like chains are being broken. I love this song that we just sang. And I throw up my hands. I praise you again and again. I want you to know our God is worthy of all praise. But just like the song we sang before that, sometimes there's a darkness. Sometimes there's a storm. We don't like the storms, we don't like the darkness, but who knows, it's in the middle of the valley, it's in the middle of the storm where we get to watch Jesus show up and realize how strong and how mighty he is. Amen. I hope you know that. Hey, we're starting a brand new series this morning called Don't Take the Bait. Everybody say, don't take it. Don't take it. Don't take the bait. What does that mean? Well, as you can tell, I am not a fisherman and I am not a hunter. And dad joke of the day, but I am a fisher of men, right, as the word says. And man, when we begin to watch people follow God and we just came out of the evangelism series and, and Jake did a phenomenal job wrapping that series up, come and see what Jesus has done for me. But then when people see Jesus and they begin to encounter Jesus, they begin to grow a theological word called sanctification where we become more like him. And what you need to realize is the enemy uses temptation, which is his bait, to stunt our spiritual growth. And what he does is he tries to get us held captive. The word says that he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, depending on the animal, there's different bait. And depending on the person, the enemy knows that there's different temptations to begin to entice us. And the word says that, that our temptations come from within, but the enemy will, will use bait. He will begin to plot certain things to try to get us off the path that God wants. And I need you to know, regardless if you've been in the church a long time or recent, we are in a spiritual war. And rather than waking up, letting life just happen to us, waiting to see if we're going to fall into temptation, we need to be aware, put on the full armor of God and say, not today, Satan. Come on, somebody. Not today. And so the first bait that we want to look at is the bait of offense. I want to give credit where credit is due. Maybe you've heard of the, the book, The Bait of Satan. John Bevere wrote it many, many years ago. And it's about the bait of offense. And we just thought we would take that kind of thought and begin to play that out in the sermon series and look at a bunch of different baits. But we are going to look at the bait of offense. Because we know if there's ever been a time in history where people are offended, it's today. Some of you today are offended that we're talking about offense. Some of y'all walked in here today and somebody stole your seat and like, I don't like you. I'm offended. Somebody didn't say hi to you. Most likely, there's some people who were offended today. And I'm here to tell you, offense feels good in the moment, but it'll destroy us in the long run. See, when you begin to take the bait of offense, it's like drinking your own poison. You want it to hurt other people, but really, it just hurts you because they're not thinking about it. You're thinking about it. And the Apostle Paul knew how crucial this was. And so we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 through 32. I promise you, you're going to get your word read to you today. But Paul is in a Roman prison. He's writing to the church of Ephesus. And if you recall, in one of the last letters to the churches, Jesus address, addresses the church of Ephesus. And he says, you don't love me like you once did. I wonder if there's somebody here today who, man, you started off strong, but you don't love Jesus quite like you once did. And what's interesting is we didn't get Revelation until later on. We know that, the book of Revelation, that is. But there was something that the Spirit was speaking to Paul as he was writing in a Roman prison to the church of Ephesus that I think he knew was going to be a trap in their spiritual development. I think the Apostle Paul knew if they are not careful, there's going to be certain things, beginning with offense and bitterness, that would begin to get in between them and God. So with that in mind, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ Jesus, 
has forgiven you. I don't normally do this, but if you're by somebody who you're connected with, truly, not someone you wish you were connected with, if you know what I mean, I want you to put your hand on them, and I want us to pray. Father, as we come into prayer this morning, I pray that you meet us. Lord, this is a tough topic, because when we begin to discuss forgiveness and things of that nature, it, it brings back to hard memories. There might be anxiety that kind of falls on us right now as we begin to realize maybe the Lord's wanting to speak to us about that person who hurt us, and that's hard. And so, God, I, I'm well aware this morning of the spiritual attacks on people. I'm well aware of my inadequacy to communicate the truths in this word, but I know that through the spirit of the living God, God, that this word will never be returned in void. So I'm asking for healing. I'm asking for chains to be broken. Not just set aside, but broken. Father, free us from the bait of offense. We pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen. You may be seated. Hey, we want to welcome you here today. If you're new to the Weld Church, man, we are one church in two locations in Marshfield and in Springfield. My name is Dylan. I am the campus pastor. We welcome you today. Have you, I'm just curious, have you ever offended somebody without knowing that you offended them? Raise your hand if you can relate, right? Some of y'all. I remember several years ago, I was in a meeting. It was with some different church leaders. And it was a very important meeting, especially for me, because it involved me, it involved my future. And we were sitting there at this meeting, and it was, it was a good meeting. All was going well. But there was somebody in the meeting who was actually one of my good friends who I could tell was a little bit standoffish to me. He was a little bit aloof, and so we, we continued to conduct the meeting, and, and we go through it, and, and all went well. But we were in the lobby afterwards, and I went up to him, and I was just talking with him and trying to do, you know, catch up. And I just said, hey, man, I said, we got to get together for lunch soon, a.k.a. I want to know, hey, are, are we good, right? And he said, dude, you never texted me back when I texted you several weeks ago. I said, dude, you did not text me. Aren't you thankful for iPhones where you can go back, right? And I start sweating. I'm like, Lord, please let there be a text message there. Or not, please let there not be a text message. And so I go back at my phone, and, and I look. I said, look, you didn't text me. He said, yeah, I did. And he went in his message. He goes, my bad, man. I sent that to the wrong person. <laughs> the entire meeting, talking about spiritual matters, he could not quite look at me the way that he could before because he thought that I did not text him back, and I offended him. And I'm not picking on him. He's a, cr a close brother in Christ to me. See, I've done that as well. Probably you have as well. You, you were offended and come to find out you really didn't need to be offended after all. But if I'm being honest, I know that in a room this size, there's some of you, we're not talking about text messages that were or were not sent to you. We're talking about somebody who's hurt you. We're talking about a, a pattern of decisions that has shaped your lens of humanity. When, when you begin to have a relationship, it's really hard for you to trust people because you've been let down. Because people that are in positions to love you the most are in positions to hurt you the most. Would you agree? And then when we begin to get let down and when people hurt us, we begin to have a short fuse. And, and, and when we begin to be offended, the enemy wants to begin to isolate us and not trust people and can begin to open us up and be susceptible to different temptations. You need to know here this morning that when we live life through the, the lens of offense, we will never live the life that God has for us. When we constantly are offended, we will look at people as threats. And I'm here to tell you, there's only one threat in this world that really matters. And it's not the threat of others. It's a threat against good and evil, God and Satan. And I want you to know the enemy tries to get us to take the bait of offense so that way our spiritual growth will be stunted. If you're with me, say amen. amen. So what I want to look at here today is that the bait of offense opens the door to all types of evil. Now we're going to break that down in the scripture, but in a very practical way, I want you to think about it. Why do people get upset? It's when expectations were not met. And why is it that in so many marriages when divorce happens, there's anger, there's resentment, there's bitterness. Carrie Underwood, I think, was the singer who would go in and beat up the truck, right? Is it Carrie Underwood? Yes, yeah, sinners. No, I'm joking. <laughs> right? We get offended and we get upset 
in an extreme circumstances, situations, you watch people begin to get angry and then begin to take it out and drinking and drugs and adultery and all these different matters. Now, I know that it doesn't get to that a lot of times, but you need to realize that the enemy tries to get us to take the bite of offense. So that way we begin to end up in areas and doing things that we never thought we would do. But really, I think there's three things that kind of make up offense. And the first thing is being offended by others. Being offended by others. I need you to know that offense 100% is going to come your way. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? You will be offended because we are human and we live in a broken world, right? So when we know that we are going to be offended, it's not a question if we'll be offended, but when. And then it's what will our response be? When we are offended, will our response to be the victim and just run with that and allow the enemy to begin to make us bitter and jealous and frustrated and begin to gossip and slander people? Or will we say, not today. I'm not taking that bite today. Because when we begin to go there, we open ourselves up for temptations you never thought possible. Let's look at it again, verse 31. Get rid of all, somebody say all. All bitterness. And then it says, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Now remember, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus. There's Christians. He knows that there's new converts, and he knows that there's been people to help start the church. But he says, get rid of all. But when he says, get rid of all, he's insinuating that it is already there. Some of you today, you might already be there. God is moving in your life. You, you have joy most of the time. You, you're reading the word. You're, you're, you're giving to the church. You're, you're using your time, talents, and treasures. But for some reason, it seems like something continues to get you back to this state of offense. And I want you to know, if the enemy can get you to take the bait of offense, all of a sudden, you will become very bitter. I'm telling you, 99% of the time, if there's a bitter person, it's because they were offended. But if you notice that it continues to say all types of evil. So get rid of bitterness. And then it goes to rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, which I've already hit on that a little bit. That makes sense, right? But he doesn't stop there. As well as all types of evil behavior. If we give the enemy an inch, he will take a mile. And if he can get us offended and then bitter and then angry, well, then it's, you know what? This day is ruined already. I'm just going to go ahead and do this. You might think that I'm crazy. You might think that I'm just trying to stretch this, but I'm here to tell you, if you ask our ministry team, this is not far-fetched at all. People begin to get upset and do things that they never thought they would do simply because they were offended. I didn't like what mom and dad told me to do and my curfew and all that. So I went and I did whatever I wanted. I'm offended. How did you get up? How, how did you end up here? People that are addicted, people that are, are in so many different circumstances where they just, they can't seem to quite get out of this trouble. It didn't start with something small. Excuse me, it didn't start with something big. It started with something small and gradually they ended up becoming more and more and more susceptible to the enemy's traps because they were offended. Here's what John Bevere says. He says that bitterness is a root. If roots are nursed, watered, protected, fed, and given attention, they increase in depth and strength. If not dealt with quickly, roots are hard to pull up. The strength of the offense will continue to grow. We are therefore exhorted not to let the sun go down on our wrath. Now instead of the fruit of righteousness being produced, we will see a harvest of anger, resentment, jealousy, hatred, strife, and discord. Jesus called these evil fruits. I need you to know here today, there's only two types of fruit when it comes to spiritual terms. The fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of the flesh. Found in Galatians chapter 5, there are nine characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit. You can go and look at it in your own time. But it's 
also followed up by and, and talked about prior to the fruits of the flesh. It, it, it's our own evil desires. It, it's what Dylan wants to do rather than what the spirit wants to do. Are there any gardeners in here? You love gardening? There's no one here? Okay, great. That's awesome. Awesome. I'm glad that illustration really connected with you right there. The other day, I was walking out, and I, I see all these little mini trees out in our, in our, you know, area outside. It's not a garden. I'm not even about to call it a garden because it's not a garden. But I, but I walk out, and I see all of our flowers, and then there's just these little trees, trees, a.k.a. weeds. And I was like, man, I know I picked those. I know I picked those up. And then, you know, my, my family members assure me, well, you didn't get to the root, Dylan. I know you don't know what you're doing, but you got to get to the root, Thanks, Grams. Thanks, Selena. I appreciate that. So there I am. I'm, I'm getting the roots, and I'm working hard to get the roots out. And, and, and I think that creates a good picture because sometimes God is absolutely growing you. There is fruit in your life. And so you see the Spirit of God beginning to produce all these different things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But then contrary, the, the flesh is saying, I don't want to do that. As the Apostle Paul says, man, what I want to do, I don't do. But what I don't want to do, I do. And so sometimes we're watching God move, and, and, he's, and he's growing us, but meanwhile... Our flesh begins to sprout up, and I'm here to tell you, when that happens, rather than just leaving it there, do you know how many times I drove by and saw, man, I should go and pick those up, but I'll get it later. And then I come back, and it was much harder to rip out. I'm telling you, the, God has been knocking on your door for a while saying, we've got to deal with this, this bitterness. We've got to deal with this debate of offense because I'm telling you, it's hindering what I'm wanting to do in and through you. And until God goes in and rips out the root of offense, you will never be able to do nor be until God deals with it. Can I get an amen? That's what it's looking like. And it says this in Proverbs 19, 11, a person's wisdom yields patience. Listen, some of you here today need to know, man, one of the key differences between knowledge and wisdom is application. You can know a whole lot about God and not know God. You can know a whole lot of scriptures, but until it is lived out, it's just knowledge. It's not wisdom. See, it yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook and offense. It's not that you don't recognize the offense, but it's you refuse to give in to it. But I need you to know it's also not telling us to be a doormat where we just got to let anybody and everybody walk over us. That's not the case. But more times than not, it's not those big drastic things. It's the things where if we would just look over the offense, it would begin to lose its weight in our life. See, I don't know about you, but when I read the, the last line, it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. I've never watched a movie. Like one of those just, man, you know, just like, just oh, superhero movies or just like, that's a bad dude right there where they get insulted and they say, don't worry about it, man. Like that movie is boring. It's the movie where, what'd you say? Come get some, big dog, right? Like, that's the thing where it's like, there's something within, at least men, a lot of times it's like, I'm going to kill you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> right? Like, you can't make this up. I remember picking my dad up out of prison many years ago. I said, man, let's go through the scriptures. And we're going through all this stuff. And I'm breaking down all these, you know, scriptures that he had questions. He said, Deej, he's like, here's what I think God's called me to do. I said, dad, what's God called you to do? To beat people up in the name of Jesus. I said, No. It's not what he's called you to do. And so it's contrary. It's a paradox to say, when somebody offends me, stay with me. When someone offends me, there's something within me, which is the flesh, remember, that's like, I'm going to show you. I'm going to be very crafty with my words. I'm going to be very arrogant. I'm going to show you, you just mess with the wrong guy. That is so ingrained in my sinful nature because that's what I was accustomed to all my life. And so when the spirit of God comes up with it within me and somebody offends me and I say, I'm not going to take that bait today. Jesus, help me. And I don't give it into it. What happens is then I just shame them by loving them the way that Christ loves them. And some of you today are so hot-headed and quick-tempered 
And man, you are quick to speak and slow to listen. And I want you to know here today that little do you know the enemy has you exactly where he wants you. Which leads to our second point, we're going to offend others. I think a lot of times we're okay with talking about how other people offend us. But then this is where the offense comes in. When we offend others, that's a whole different ballgame. We can talk about the first point, but the second point, that's offensive. But I want you to know we offend people more than what we know. And while there are some things we cannot own, there are things that we can own when it comes to this matter. So here's what it says again, verse 31. You're going to get your Bible reading today. It says, get rid of all bitterness. And here's where I want to focus on. Rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. I want you to read that with me, please. On the count of three, one, two, three. Rage, anger, harsh words, and slander. These are the fruits of the flesh. This is when we are offended, someone offends us, we begin to say these things. You've seen it, right? I don't know, there's this new invention called social media. Maybe you've heard of it, or I'm not sure. If you post something, you say something, you're trying to, to get a reaction. And I know we live in a very controversial world. I promise you I'm going to stay away from all that today. But I need you to know I'm talking to Christians. I'm talking to Christians. Who am I talking to? Christians. Who am I talking to? Christians. Those who have the spirit of God. I'm not talking to the world. I'm talking to the Christians as the Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Ephesus. I need you to know. While there are some things we cannot own in offending people, there are some things that we do own, and it is what we say with our mouths. Should the number one thing we talk about be this or this or this? Listen, there's a time and place for healthy discussion. But if the, that discussion begins to interfere with the main discussion of Jesus Christ, we are no longer doing God a favor, but instead we're doing him a disservice. So what we must do is make sure to point people to Jesus and learn how to disagree with each other. Man, everybody's canceled. And this is not a church thing. This is a secular thing. I don't like that. Boom, you're canceled. You said this, you're canceled. And we live in this secular culture where everyone's canceled. And so we've, we've missed the art of disagreeing. Listen, God didn't say that we're all going to agree. The Apostle Paul and Barnabas did not agree but they came back together and reconciled because they said, man, if we're not careful, we're going to take the bait of Satan. And rather than taking the bait of Satan, let's take the bait of God. I'm preaching better than you're talking here today. We need to understand the tactics of the enemy. Here's what Ephesians says in verse 15 and 16 of chapter 4. It says, instead, a.k.a. doing all this stuff, instead... We will speak the truth in love. What's the ultimate truth? It's not your opinion. It's God's word. Amen? Come on, somebody. I hope you're offended today. Growing in every way, check this out, more and more like Christ. Who's our example? Is it our people we follow on social media? Is it even the pastors and the leaders? No, our example is Christ and Christ alone who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Here's what I need you to know here today. Satan himself knows he cannot destroy God's church, so he knows the best thing he can do is distract it. If the gates of hell will not prevail against God, then what we, must have, what we must do is begin to look out and say, how is the enemy trying to get in? And the Apostle Paul is, is writing to this church, and we know that the church is not the building, but the people. We know it's many parts of one body. I don't know if you're an arm. I don't know what body part you are. You let the Lord tell you that. But what I do know is this. 
It is our responsibility to speak the truth in love and make sure that Christ is the center and that we are growing more like God. So that way when people on the outside see your life and talk to you, they say, why are you the way that you are? And more than anything else in your life, more than being a mom or a dad or, or a loved one or whatever it might be, you say, I am a child of the one true king. And ma'am, sir, I need you to know there's a spot here for you. If you leave it up on the screen, as it says, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing full of love. We must be wise with our words, stay with me, so that way the enemy cannot use that for his advantage. I want to ask you something very practical. When you're out and about, do people grow closer to the Lord because of your walk or farther away? This past week, I, I went into the gym and there were so many people from our church in there. It was awesome. I just, I'm just watching them just, obviously they're being healthy, they're, 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 they're getting stronger, that's great. They're flexing in the mirror with their cameras and all that, that's something else though, but God bless them. But they're encouraging one another. They're praying for one another. They're helping one another. They're being there for one another. And, and, I'm, and I'm watching this take place and I'm just so proud in that moment that the church has left the building. And I guarantee you, there's so many of you, if I could come to your workplace, which I know you don't want that, I don't blame you, but if I could follow you, if, if I could watch the way that you talk to people, it would be so incredible to see how God is using you to further the kingdom. There's people that are sitting in the seats here today because you love them outside of the church walls, and now they come every single Sunday. Isn't that amazing? But I'm also well aware that if I followed you around, if we listen to you talk, if we watch what you did, you would begin to realize that, man, you're not speaking the truth in love like you need to. And, and maybe for you it's funny to kind of say certain jokes, off-color jokes. Maybe for some of you it, it, it's, ha, ha, it's just kind of guy talk. Maybe it's funny for you to kind of talk about that girl or, or, or about that guy. And it, it, it's kind of funny to slander and gossip just like we kind of read earlier. And what I need you to know here today is you have a responsibility to honor God out there as well as in here. Amen? And rather than people being offended by your life, let them be intrigued and know, I want to know this God that you serve. See, come and see what God has done loses its power. Not completely, because God will never lose his power, but will begin to lose its power and urgency when they don't like what they see in you. And so our third and final point is not only do we know that we're offended by others and that we will offend people, we're gonna try not to, then we gotta ask the question, well, how do we deal with it? Some of you here today look up at me, you know who's offended you. Some of you today, you know that your words have offended someone else. So what do you do with that tension? Well, I want to look at Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. Again, I'm not going to read 31. I'm just going to look at the bottom of verse 32. It says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And I wonder if as soon as you see that word forgiveness and you apply it to the context in which someone's offended you, not just offended you, but has hurt you, who has said something to you that should never have been said, has done something to you that you wouldn't, you wouldn't wish that for your worst enemy. And here's what I need you to know. I am sorry. God is sorry. It breaks his heart. He loves you and he wants to heal you. But what I also want to say to you today, not as the, the pastor who's had it all figured out for so long and has no pain and, and all those different things, but as somebody who's 
experience his own hurt as well. If we do not allow God to come in and heal the bitterness, it will be the greatest tactic that the enemy has the rest of our lives. And here's what God wants for you today. He wants you to be freed from this bait of Satan. Amen? Does anybody believe that today? And I just want to throw this in here. Dylan, how, how do I go about forgiving people? Well, I want you to think of a time where you were forgiven. I, I want you to think of a time where you deserved something, but you didn't get it. It was mercy. I, I want you to think of a time where you offended somebody and they so graciously loved you. That is what we are called to do. And, and some of you, before we hit it hard as we wrap this up, some of you have just kind of had petty offenses happen to you. And, and I heard this long ago, and I need you to hear this today. What you can forget, you need to forget. But what you can't forget, you must learn to forgive. So I want to look at this last one as the worship team comes up in Matthew 5, 23 through 25. It says, so if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar, and for context, you need to know this is prior to Jesus being crucified on the cross, his blood shed for us. And so they would have to go and offer different burnt offerings to be forgiven. And so with that in mind, they're, they're coming to the altar. They're coming to the temple to be forgiven of their sins. And it says, and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Now I need you to know, in this context, it's, Someone has something against you, not the other way around. So leave your sacrifice there at the altar and go and be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. And when you are on the way to court with your adversary, settle your differences quickly. And some of you, I'm praying by the grace of God. Like since you were a little kid, this has been something the enemy's gotten you with. I'm praying by the Spirit of God that you have freedom today. It's so beautiful to sit with somebody and watch the, the chains be broken as they have this freedom of somebody who's hurt them. But also there's, there's times where we've hurt someone. Some of you, you have hurt somebody badly emotionally, mentally, physically, and you want to go back so bad. You can't. So maybe your bait is not that you were hurt, but it's you hurt someone and you feel like that you're stuck. You feel like this will be your story the rest of your life. And here's what I want to tell you. No, it will not. Because your past does not define you. Some of you, you're here and you're, you're worshiping and, and you're wondering, man, Dylan, I, I'm growing in God and, and I'm seeing fruit, but they, there just seems to be a hindrance. Well, the word actually tells us that sometimes our prayers won't be answered because we have not been forgiven. We, we have not forgiven someone. And, and God is not telling you that you must forgive so that way you can get, get over it, but he's saying, I want to minister to you. I want to minister through you. And if you notice here, he says, go. Don't, don't, don't fulfill your, your sacrifice. Leave it at the altar and go. Some of you, the, the Spirit of God has been prompting you for a while now to go and try to reconcile with that person and, and you're too prideful. I'm not. I won't. He had it coming. She should have. I'm bad. No. And what you don't realize is the enemy's got you right where he wants you. And what's sad is it's clear to everyone else, but it's not clear to you. So what you do is you go in humility and you try to seek out restoration, reconciliation. But I need you to know reconciliation takes two. So even if you get to the point of truly humbly 
coming to that person and, and trying to be reconciled, if they don't want to, that's okay. You need to know you're not responsible for their obedience. You're responsible for yours. You trust God and trust him with the consequences. But what about the person? This is where I want to hone in. Where in the world's eyes and even inside the church, it's justified to not forgive. In my 13 years of being in full-time ministry, excuse me, 10 years of being in full-time ministry, 13 years of being saved, the amount of grown men and grown women who I've sat across from. And when this subject gets brought up, the amount of pain, the amount of hurt, the amount, the amount of resentment, and shall I say, hatred, that rises up is heartbreaking. And as you hear these people tell their stories, there's some of you here today, I know your stories and it breaks my heart. I don't know why. I know the enemy's the one. But here's what I do know. God loves you. And he wants you to come to this place where that person no longer has a hold on your life because you shamed him through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that offends some of you and I welcome you into this conversation. By no means am I telling you to get over it and you're fine, that is not what I'm saying. Get the help that you need. We will come alongside of you. We will provide counseling. But I need you to know, don't let a chapter in your life, even if it's a dark chapter, be the ending of your story. And I remember a time in my life, and I wish I could say it was a long, long time ago, where I was justified in my mind of hating someone. It's not fair. Should have never had to go through that. You manipulated me. You took advantage of me. And I want you to know, I hate you. And it felt good saying it. It felt good and justified. And I had well-meaning people around me say, hey, I don't blame you. But I just remember being in the presence of God. He says, forgive, Dylan. Because I forgive. See, Dylan, everyone deserves to be up on the cross with Jesus. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus in his lowest moment looks at the people who put him on the cross knowing he could throw himself off the cross, knowing he could call thousands of angels around him, but instead has the audacity to say, Father, forgive them. They not know what they do. And don't you know in that moment, the soldiers and the spectators had to take a step back and say, a guilty man doesn't say that. And I want you to know the person who hurts you who you think is your adversary, which means opponent, actually isn't your adversary. Oh, we're not giving them a free pass. No, we have free will and they will be held to a standard of God's judgment one day. But here's what I know. Our ultimate adversary is not him or her, it's the enemy. It's the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I'm here to tell somebody today, 
the way you shame the enemy, the way you shame the person who hurts you, the way that you begin to allow God to give you a new chapter and allow God to come in and rip that root out and let the fruit of God come in where you can look at people and say, I am not bound to my past. I am bound to the freedom of God. And so no longer do you have a grip on me. It's God and God alone because I am forgiven, I am loved. Man, it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that there's not times where it comes back up, but when it gets brought up again, I'm gonna leave it at the feet of Jesus. And so, in a room this size, I want you to close your eyes. Father, I just feel this. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come forward. If you're not on the prayer, or if you're on the prayer team but not scheduled today, maybe a couple others come forward. I just feel like we might need it today. Not everyone. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to reopen a wound just to do it. But it, as it's been said, you've been trying to cover it up with Band-Aids and duct tape and stitches. And it's gotten infected and you're, you're doing good. You're saved. But God needs to go in and do some surgery to get that infection out. And I know you're justified in the world's eyes and it's not fair. But if you're being honest, you would admit you still don't have freedom. And I know it's a brave statement, but I'm here to tell you the only way, the only path to freedom is, for, is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the antidote to bitterness. So young and old, male and female, I don't care how many certificates you have on the wall. I don't care your bank account. I don't care how respectable of a person you are and your family are. We've all got wounds. Some of you got some dad wounds. You got some mama wounds. You've got some coworker wounds. You got some wounds. There's people in this church even who, the enemy's tried to hinder your growth because you're faced to see that person. You know who it is. So head bows and I, eyes closed. If you're here in, the, in this place, this is you and God. If you've been offended by someone, and you're ready to receive healing, if you're ready to give that bitterness to the Lord, you're ready to exchange it for freedom, I want you to lift a hand in this place, all over, lift it up, eyes closed, you can put it down. It's all over this room. Father, I pray right now, you minister to hearts. I pray Satan is losing the hold in people's hearts right now. The person who is hurt, the person who is abused, the person who was manipulated, the person who is forsaken, the person who was bullied, the person who was fill in the blank. Father, minister to him right now in Jesus' name. Let him receive the healing. Right now, I'm wondering if there's somebody in this place, maybe you have been offended, but you know you have offended people. And I'm not talking about things that you don't need to own, but you know there are some things you, you do need to own. 
and you want to build up God's church. You want to make sure that the bait is removed between you and someone. If, there's, if you need healing in a situation, if you feel like you've offended someone and you need to humble yourself and reach out for reconciliation, heads bowed, eyes closed, I just want you to lift a hand. I want to see it. I want to see the tangible. You put it down. Here's what I want to do. I want you to stand. The altars are open. Our prayer team's here. We're going to let God be God. There's almost every single hand raised in this place. You can treat your seat as an altar. You can come down and pray at the altars. We're going to let God minister to the offense.